Recorded at Get a Grip Studios in Toronto, Canada. A Get a Grip management production and in association with the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. Financially supported by the good folks at the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors, this is Restoring Darkness podcast. This episode of Restoring Darkness is brought to you by Evluma. If you're serious about contributing to the reduction of light pollution, go to evluma.com, hover over products, and click on Dark Sky Friendly Lighting. Both the OmniMax and AreaMax lights are International Dark Sky Association certified. The warmer color temperatures of the OmniMax reduce the more easily scattered blue wavelengths, which contribute to glare and sky glow. With AreaMax lights, you get full cutoff, which also means no uplight and a significantly reduced contribution to sky glow. And all of Avluma's outdoor lighting product lines come with dimmable drivers for even more control. If your customer is looking for dark sky friendly fixtures with energy savings while still meeting the demands of decorative lighting, look no further than Evluma. Evluma, illuminating the pursuit of dark skies. Welcome back, folks, to the Restoring Darkness podcast. And, you know, since John Bullock's been coming on the show, this podcast has charted in on Apple Podcasts all over the world. And it's been really wonderful, including one of those places in South Africa. We charted at number nine in South Africa um, on the in the design charts of Apple Podcasts all over Europe, Sweden, Denmark, uh, Germany, the Netherlands, and the UK. That's right. And the North Americans got to wake up, John Bullock. But on the show I think today, they, well, it's about time they do. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well, John. On today's show, we have Dr. Valerie Shrimplin. Um, she studied at the universities of Bristol, Manchester, and Witwatersrand. Uh, Dr. Valerie Shrimplin has lectured widely on Byzantine, medieval, and Renaissance art and architecture. She is particularly interested in the influence of astronomy and cosmology on art, including her PhD on the influence of Copernican heliocentricity on uh, Michelangelo's Sistine, Sistine Last Judgment. She holds the honorary title of Senior Research Associate at Gresham College, London, and now works freelance to pursue her writing and research interests. She is international chair of the series of Conferences on the Inspiration of Astron- Astronomical Phenomenon. That is www.insap.org. Dr. Shrimplin, welcome to the Get a, uh, welcome to the Restoring Darkness podcast. I almost said Get a Grip, Scott, but I do a lot of lighting podcasts. This one's the Restoring <laughs> Darkness podcast. Tell us a little bit, before we even start... We're talking about the convergence of art and beauty and, you know, uh, history with our natural world, our planet, the skies above us and how it inspires us. Tell, Tell me why you started studying this or how you got down this path. Well, yeah, firstly, thank you very much for inviting me to join you and to talk to you. And I hope what I've got to say might be of interest to your listeners. Um, The interaction between art, astronomy, cosmology has interested me for a long time. I suppose my interest in, you know, the stars and the night sky rose from growing up on the edge of a college, uh, on the edge of a common in a village um, about 30 miles north of London, where the stars were very good. And then we, we, we used to holiday in more remote areas like Devon in the UK. But then after that, I I lived in Greece for several years, four or five years in Greece, where the stars were amazing. If you look in a, if you're in a Greek village on a Greek hillside. And then I actually went to live in South Africa, where as well as living in a a large urban area, um, we also visited conservation areas a great deal. So I got more and more interested in astronomy. And I, I had friends, very close friends who were astronomers. So as a, since I studied history and art history, um, I sort of got to look at, to try and bridge the gap, as it were, um, because, uh, you know, astronomers don't know a lot about art history and art historians are a bit scared at looking in scientific books. So out of that, um, my research on Michelangelo and Copernican heliocentricity developed. That was in the 1980s. It was quite some time ago. And after that, I got involved with the conferences on the inspiration of astronomical phenomena. 
And they were really, really brilliant. They're still going on. There was a meeting at Caltech in Pasadena last September. And it's a real mixture of people. You get astrophysicists, sculptors, architects, um, who, people who do humanities, literature, and so on. And they were sort of looking at how astronomy and the arts have influenced um, the arts, humanities, literature. And it's it really is absolutely fascinating because so much just goes back to astronomy. Um, and, and the stars, you know, they're, they're just so important to all of us. And I think we're losing that. Mm -hmm. um, I, are we, have we underestimated the role that, like, viewing the stars? Like, I often say, like, there's a reason why our ancestors sent burnt lamb smoke to heaven, right? They burned things to send the smoke up to heaven or whatever. Are we underestimating, like, a sort of spiritual evolution that is tightly intertwined with the, the heavens? Yeah, I think I think there is a very strong spiritual element here tied in with the heavens, but there's also a very practical and scientific hmm. influence here. And to take the last first, and it's actually in Plato, I could give you the reference later on, that without astronomy, you know, it really rules our lives. Um, time frames, the seasons, clocks, the 24-hour clock, it's a real framework for actually all of human existence. But alongside that, you've also got the spiritual element. I've got a couple of quotations I'd like to share with you. Um, mm. One is by Ralph Waldo Emerson, your American guy, 1836. <clears throat> he wrote that if the stars should appear um, one night in a thousand years, how, you know, people would go crazy, how men would admire, but they come out every night mm. um, and, and their beauty lights the universe. And so, you know, we're, they're so familiar that we, we tend not to look at them. But in fact, we're losing this. And I think mm. that's a real pity. And the other, the other great quotation I like to mention is Lord Martin Rees, the Astronomer Royal in England. And this, he said this in 1997. It's when he was talking about the Big Bang and how the Earth came from an initial fireball. But on at least one, one planet, in one galaxy, round one sun, um, creatures have evolved that are sophisticated enough to ponder how it all happened, you know, where we all came from, where it all came from, where we're all going, the beginning and the end and so on. I've done quite a bit of work on looking at visual images of the beginning and end, which, you know, I, I tend to focus at the moment, I'm doing research, but I focus at the moment on the Judeo-Christian idea from the book of Genesis, which is the most incredible poem. But if you take that as symbolic, actually, the time scale is very similar. The, mm -hmm. Not the time scale, the order of the events. The order of operations is the same. The order of events is very similar, mm. although, of course, in, in the Judeo-Christian Bible, it's over a week, whereas mm. it's over 13.8 billion years. But, you know, Dr. Shrimplin, I mean... Yeah. Please call when, me Valerie, by the way. Okay, Valerie. When people start, when I tell people to read the book of Genesis, for example, and they say, well, do you, do you, do you believe that Adam and Eve were a real person? I tell them, you're missing the point of the story. Do you really think that like there was a guy up in heaven in the book of Job watching God and the devil have a conversation? Like, are you really think that happened? Or do you think there is a, a depth to this story that our ancestors preserved for us for thousands of years that you should just read it and be absorbed by the beauty of it in a way. Am I, 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 I think no, we're lacking no, that I, or something? I think I'm, I, I'm with you on that. Um, you can take it as literal or you can take it as symbolic. And I think really it's the attempt to explain things and people think about um, the beginning of, put it this way, you think about the beginning of the universe, the beginning of the solar system, the beginning of the planet, the beginning of us, me. Mm -hmm. Now, people that, um, you know, you've got the contrast between the Big Bang and the steady state theories with the two main contrasts. But if you look at the end, as it were, people are beginning to worry a bit about the end of the planet. Well, the, the planet is actually not at risk until the sun becomes a red drone. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the lifestyle of some people on Earth, yes. not all of them but it's lifestyle that's at risk. Mm -hmm. People don't really worry about the end of the universe, not, not 
yet a while. But everybody worries about the end of me. So there are different things that we can think and worry about. And I think that this all comes into the spiritual idea, um, whether it's Christianity or Hindu or um, Native American myths. Mm. There are many, many myths con connected with the creation, the beginning and end, or say even an explanation of the Milky Way, which so few people can see nowadays. Mm. We could we actually if you'd like to bring up an image. Sure. You could bring up image number five and image number six. We mm -hmm. bring up image number five, which is from um, God creating the universe in Montreal in the this is twelfth century in the eleven eighties, and you can see here you've got an, the idea of of um, the creator sitting outside a, a spherical universe and creating the sun and the moon and the stars, and it's the stars that are so important here. Um, or if you and look so just at, for those listening, just for those listening, what you see is sort of like a fresco image um, of a It's actually a mosaic. Is it a mosaic? Yeah. Of a, it's actually uh, a mosaic, and it's a mosaic in a very large church in Sicily, and in Montreal. And God is sitting yeah. on, on the moon or something, and he's, it looks like he's almost polishing the earth with stars or something like that. That's, yes, I, I, I've never heard of that. He's sort of holding it. He does actually look as if he's polishing it. But the interesting thing here is how important the stars are. When you think of um, spiritual symbolism, you've got the sun and the moon, but actually the stars play a hugely important part as well. Stars crop up in a lot of images of the creation. You find them on, on ceiling designs from Giotto at Padua, to um, the Sistine Chapel before Michelangelo painted it, it was covered in stars. Hmm. Or if we look at um, slide number six, which is St. Mark's uh, in Venice, which is the creation cycle, a little bit later, early 13th century. And again, you've got panels here showing the creation of the sun and the moon and the planets and the stars. And the order, the sort of the separation of darkness and light is something that people are looking at now again because of the dark skies. Mm -hmm. and, and darkness has its own meaning. It's not just the absence of light and vice versa. And here you see we have the, the separation of light from dark, um, the creation mm -hmm. of, of the, um, the sun and the moon and the planets, and then coming down to... Um, the creation of, of plants and animals and humanity. And actually, uh, not everybody knows there are two slightly different versions in the Bible. In, in Genesis 1, um, then um, God creates Adam and Eve together, whereas in Genesis mm -hmm. 2, they talk about creating Eve mm -hmm. from the rib, rib of Adam. Mm -hmm. um, and so these slightly different versions. But here you see these are in large cathedrals where um, the images, these are mosaics, you also get frescoes. They're used as the Bible of the illiterate, as it were. They're used to tell the story. They're used mm -hmm. to tell um, or to pass on knowledge. Because And so if, if we're looking at this, if you start at the right point on this painting here, which is like a, a circle, which is on a ceiling, if you're lying on the ground looking up at it, yeah. you start at one point, you basically walk through the Genesis story through by images. That's right. It, kind of like Egyptian, it. what are those called? Egyptian hieroglyphs, where it's telling you what's happening by the way the image is. Yeah, it's very beautiful, actually. Yeah. The thing is that that is actually in the dome. But the image there wow. is looking upwards into a dome. Now, domed architecture is actually imitative of natural eye observation of the flat earth covered by the dome of heaven. Mm -hmm. If you go out to a, a remote area in the middle of the night, or, or in the daytime. The earth to, to, to nature looks flat. You know, we don't know we're standing on a sphere. We don't, we don't know we're hurtling around the sun at, at 600 and something rather miles an hour. Um, but this, the, the fact that it's on a dome is significant because even when people realized and, and educated people since the classical era, realized the earth was spherical, um, they, the, the Christian iconography of the flat earth covered by the dome of heaven continues. And so domes have mm. this symbolic celestial uh, feeling. So looking at, at these and, and using it to um, tell the story is important. But 
a lot of the other images, I can show some examples, would actually be from man <clears throat> manuscripts hmm. where it wouldn't be for the general public so much as for the intelligentsia. Mm -hmm. Why and, is it? And, let me. Can I? I just want to interrupt you. And then, John, I'm going to turn it over to John to take over the interview for a bit. But why is it so important for humans to explain why we're here? Like that's what's going on. It's like you have this. People are like, this is an absolutely gorgeous piece of artwork. If it's on a dome, and I, I can't imagine what it would cost to make that today. Like it's just so. It's so intricate. It would just be impossible to do. Yes, I don't yeah. think we could make it. Um, but the it, it's obviously these people are very concerned with who we are and where we come from, like yes. very concerned. Would they let you lie on the floor of this cathedral for an hour or two to look at this, or is that against the rules? Uh, I doubt it because that that dome is actually in the entrance part of, of mm. St Mark's in Venice, wow. and if you lay on the floor, people are going to start tripping over you in the in the entrance to the, to the cathedral, but. I think the idea is that theology and knowledge and science and spirituality, they were all one subject. Mm -hmm. This split between science and religious is a post 17th century phenomenon. When we started splitting things up and looking at things in silos, you know, mm -hmm. science is here, astronomy is here, art is here and sort of never the twain or more shall meet. Mm -hmm. Whereas at this time, of course, cosmology and theology were the same thing. And each um, each civilization has its own answers. Each mm -hmm. each civilization thinks there is the correct one. But there's a there's a nice example I, I just which springs to mind. Mm -hmm. um, in the early 20th century, um, I can't remember off the top of my head which tribe it was, but in in the um, Papua New Guinea area, I think it was. Some researchers were asking some native tribesmen what was their what was their theory of the creation, and they, the the reply was that we don't have a theory. It simply the universe simply always existed and always will. Well, that's the theory. That is actually the steady mm. state theory, that it didn't come from a particular moment, but it was just always there and always will. But always people would ask. And, and others would attempt to explain because the, um, you know, the difference between the steady state and the Big Bang of a particular moment. And again, and this crops up in the Bible, um, again, you've got um, whether the creation was from nothing or from chaos, whether there was some pre-existing primordial chaos and then it all came together or whether it was there was actually nothing, not even the laws of physics. You know, did it, can, yeah, oh, did it happen before the just... laws of physics? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Before we knew about them, um, before we started mm. to unweave our rainbows. Mm. Uh, yes. And I think it's just, you know, it's, you know, every, Michael, every, every society on this planet has got its creation myth because yeah. everyone's going to say, I wonder what this is all about at some point. Um, for me, yeah, I, I'm a practicing lighting designer, Valerie. I mean, that basically, that, that's right. what I do, uh, yeah. which means every now and again, I have to cross swords. And I mean that with science. Yes, and yes. so, yeah, it's, so yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a great fan of the astrologer and I'm not a great fan of the astronomer because I think that the, oh, really? the real the real stories lie with the myths. Um, I, I yeah, obviously not newspaper astrologers and all of that nonsense but the idea that you know the, the mystery in in the sky is is part of is part of our existence and it's part of the stories that we tell ourselves absolutely uh, and i it, it's interesting now because we, we're starting to get up get to a point where we're saying to science i'm sorry but this isn't good enough it's no good you telling us that that you, you tell us what you know and then you tell us that the rest of it doesn't exist because you can't prove it and I've got clients who start talk to, talking to me about the emotional value of light and the emotion. And of course, oh. once you do that, you talk, that's the emotional value of the sky. And it's the emotional value of the moon and the stars and the sun. Mm. And, and the, well, exactly. I, I love the idea we could be coming back to a, to, to a time when this really matters. Yeah, I, th I think that's really important. I gave a, mm. a talk on this similar subject in the local cathedral in December near Christmas.
and we were talking about light symbolism and we were talking about you know the um christmas coincides uh with the winter solstice mm. spring with, with the equinox and some of these were taken over from the pagan gods and and embellished and amalgamated and so on and and the light and the light you know the light of the world and so on and candles has beautiful spiritual resonance um the abbey itself it's it's 11th century so it's pretty mm, yes. old S st albans this one st albans st albans cathedral yeah. yes yeah it was built it well. in the 11th century with Roman bricks that were already a, a thousand years old. It was the original mm. recycling project, mm. but it is floodlit. Mm. And this is light symbolism and it's beautiful. But actually what we decided was that at Christmas, um, so much of the light is to do with commercialization. It's to do with buying and selling. It's mm. so lit up that you can't see the sky. I mean, in most capital cities, and I know it's true in London, the sort of the fireworks and the lights and everything and floodlighting the buildings on New Year's Eve as we go into the, the next orbit of the sun around the earth. Um, you know, they're saying on the news how, how amazing all this is, but actually if they just switched off the lights, you can see the Milky Way for free. Sure. For sure. That, that, yeah, we've, Michael and I talk regularly about the power of darkness mm. and, and how, we, and how yeah. we all seem to run away from it. And that, that, what you've just described, yeah. there, the idea that at midnight you turn all the lights off and yeah, suddenly there is great. this sky canopy. That would be the um, greatest Emerson, thing ever to happen. That would be like the well, greatest em thing ever to happen. <laughs> if they turn the board off instead. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, that quote from Emerson. I mean, that that predated Asimov's yep. Nightfall, which is one of the great short stories yeah. of a society, a, well, a planetary society, where it only gets dark in terms of being able to see starlight once every ten thousand years, mm. and society, yeah. civilization collapses every ten thousand years, and nobody knows why until yeah. the second sun. But goes below the horizon and the stars come out and the people right. go mad. Because hmm. I, I, I really like story. that. Yeah, I really like that quote from Emerson. And also, I think um, it's not that people are afraid of the dark. It's people are afraid of what's in the dark. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> not, they're afraid of yeah. beasts and ghoulies and ghosts and things that go bump in the night. It's the same. If you look at European painting landscape doesn't come really come in until the early Renaissance because people were afraid of landscapes so, you know the forests which were so popular in the Romantic era and the mountains these are dangerous you know mm. the, the mountains are dangerous the the walls are in the woods and so on mm. and so forth so people are more not so much afraid of the dark but afraid of what's in it for example um and if you look at, at lighting, there's no evidence. If you look on the um, darksky.org yes. um, websites, which I'm sure you're familiar with, mm -hmm, with sure. and the un Under One Sky conference that they held in November, mm -hmm. looking at um, lighting, there is no evidence that lighting actually stops crime or, or prevents crime. Would it not be better to solve the crime problems rather than um rather than well, have lighting which can affect all the ecosystems so much you know, there's so then. much the axiomatic presupposition of all safety is that more light equals more safety this is yeah. a this is a failed hypothesis yes yes that's mm. that that's what they say and mm -hmm. from the architectural point of view and actually I come from a family of architects, my father, brother, nephew, all architects, daughter-in-law. So um, looking at lighting, um, but using it for ambiance is very different from using it, um, looking at crime, because as well on streets and we have lit motorways that link these incredibly lit towns. But mm. once you've got the light, what's beyond the light, you can't see at all. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you have to be really careful with lighting and look at its its value other than just sort of shining lights into into dark corners. Um, street lighting came in. Well, obviously, the, the ancients would have used oil lamps and then mm -hmm. actually whale whale oil lit most of Europe for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. Um, yeah. 17th, 18th century. 
And then some, there was some street lighting in London. I found an ordinance of 1417. There was some street lighting in London. Um, and then it really comes in in the, in the 19th century. Um, Electric lighting is one of the great examples of how innovation saved the species from collapsing, actually. So the reason why we have whales left this at all. This is one of Michael's theories. <laughs> no, I, no, I'm, I, I'm not kidding. They, 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 stopped, the hunt, they stopped hunting whales when they didn't need to use whale oil for electric or artificial light. Yeah, absolutely. That's when they stopped hunting yes. whales. No kidding. Yeah. I'm not kidding anybody. That's yeah. the reason why they stopped. And yeah. so well, it saved the whales. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to talk about paraffin and lamp oil then, am I? Well, but hang on. Which, so we, we, which actually we, superseded sperm whale oil but anyway this is an okay. argument that we have somewhere else yeah somewhere else but, well, there but are, there are. <laughs> yeah. um john let me just ask one more question because uh i i i can't get enough of valerie here um the 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 way in which humans engage with electric light so there's an element like you were talking about this ambiance right so we have candles or we have firelight or we have oil lamps yeah. or we have light bulbs or whatever there's this progression away from ambiance towards um darkness elimination or something does that make sense like the elimination of yes darkness. i i think so too i think you know we all automatically we come into the house and and switch on the light, you know, you mm. assume it's, it's going to happen. You just automatically switch it on and feel that that's what you're entitled to. And that, that sort of spoils sleep patterns of human beings and everything. There's a lot being written on this. I, I think the recent book by Johan Eckloff is really good on this that some of you might have heard of. Um, and I'm not really talking about that because I'm an art historian and I'm not mm -hmm. going to go into, you know, bats and, and, sure. um, Baby, baby turtles and insects, but it is so important um, that light is only used when it's when it's really necessary and when it's a when it's a good thing to do. And some people like the light, and 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 some don't. Some like pitch dark, for example, to sleep. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've I've got two grandsons, one two grands, two small grandsons. One one likes it to be, you know, he likes the light on. The other one likes the light pit, pitch dark. So it's mm. That can cause problems mm -hmm. but the thing is that lighting has to be more more thought of and looking at these and if you read some of these works um and contrast it with the art history you can see that before um the milky way was outside everyone's front door everyone was familiar mm -hmm. with it mm -hmm. um i could show you some more i'd love to show you some more medieval sure. manuscripts or i could just mention um Something that I did last summer, if, if I can just digress for a moment, sure. is I went I went to see a Shakespeare at the Globe in London, um, Shakespeare's King Lear, which, as you all know, is a huge tragedy. And mm -hmm. Shakespeare quite often introduces light relief in his tragedies, like the grave difficulty in Hamlet. Anyway, mm -hmm. in the middle of King Lear, he suddenly starts telling a joke. Why are there seven and not eight? Mm -hmm. And everyone in the audience would have, have laughed because they knew he was referring to the Pleiades, mm -hmm. which is a very, I'm sure you all know, the very well-known constellation, uh, also known as the Seven Sisters. Mm -hmm. And so Shakespeare knew that his, his audience would get a joke mm -hmm. about the Pleiades. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know for sure, but I rather doubt that the audience in London in, in summer 2022 mm -hmm. sure. got that joke. No. Because, as I said, it was outside everyone's front door. And so it was all very familiar, the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. I mean, as I mentioned, I, I spent time in Greek villages and in African um, reserves and things like conservation areas, um, did some voluntary work in Kenya and so on. But, but mm -hmm. can I just show you some... Um, can we look at a few more images sure, to, to show you what I mean about the medieval period? If you look at image number seven, this is um, this is a manuscript from the 11th century, image number mm -hmm. seven, which is actually in Madrid. And you can see the two figures here. And one of them is holding a circle. And these two figures, the circle actually represents the Milky Way. And the two figures are carrying the souls up to the Milky Way. This is where it was thought. And in, in many sort of um, mm -hmm. 
sort of less sophisticated um, creation myths and, and astrological and astronomical myths, the idea was that spirits of the dead would go up to the Milky Way. Or if we look at number eight, eight which is a French manuscript um, from 1290. And this is the most beautiful image, I think, of the Milky Way sort of mm. going ac across the top of the page from in a manuscript. And these were very common because they were familiar to everybody. Mm. Um, image number nine. Basically, what we're looking at here on the second one, folks, if you're listening, is almost like a, um, a Van Gogh-esque rendering of the Milky Way. Um, the kind of curves of the Milky Way that in it's it's stylized, but if you know what the Milky Way looks like, you, you recognize it immediately. Is that a fair description? You can recognize Donna? it, yes. Yeah. Because it's interesting that you, you bring up Van Gogh because um, his famous work, Starry Sky, which mm -hmm. um, it, it's actually image number 16, but it's so familiar to everybody, these huge great spirals in the mm -hmm. sky in his, mm -hmm. his thick painterly brushwork. And that was actually painted about the time that spiral galaxies were discovered. Hmm. But going back to the medieval period, um, it, number nine, the um, hmm. shows an image of figures on the Milky Way. It's in the Bodleian Library now. And you can see so the sort of depicting the Milky Way it was something that was so familiar to everybody. I think you've all heard the story that hmm. in 1994, a, a short blackout in Los Angeles um plunge the city into darkness have you heard of this i think it was yes august yeah. 1994 and everybody was ringing up the griffith observatory where uh professor ed krupp who was actually at, at the conference i was at in in september so people were actually scared they thought it might be aliens or something <laughs> um and then the idea of course people would observe it they would be familiar with the stars <laughs> the stars were absolutely essential for navigation sure and for following the time of days because of the way that they rotate. Well, actually, it's us that's rotating. But again, uh, in image number 10, um, in a 14th century manuscript, you can actually see that there are two um, angels sort of cranking the handles like on an old car mm -hmm. to turn the universe with the idea that the Earth is still and the universe is all rotating around. Are you... Are you suggesting universe. that this are you suggesting that this art inspired science? Like it seems like there's you talked about how they discovered the spiral universes, but the art kind of came first before the spiral universes. No, are I, you, are you think, saying that there's a perhaps they, the art itself was inspiring this type of thinking of the of the, in science? I think it was the other way around. I think with okay. Van Gogh's spiral galaxies, that's more likely to be that way around. Mm. And I think especially when. Um, Copernicus puts the sun at the center of the universe. And that, I believe, um, is reflected in Michelangelo's Last Judgment, where Christ is depicted like an Apollonian sun god in the center of, of, a, spot, of a circular composition. Mm. It's the science that comes first. Because it's important to remember that um, it, not the same for modern art and people like Van Gogh, but as far as all these... Byzantine medieval renaissance images were concerned. The artists weren't like modern day artists where you, you're, you exercise your creative spirit and then you try and sell it. They, these were commissioned. They were mm -hmm. employed by the church. Sure. And they would have been um, appointed, you know, mosaicists, mm -hmm. fresco painters, sculptors and so on. And they would have had theological advisors. They wouldn't mm -hmm. have been left to do Mm. what they felt like. The same even applies to sure. Michelangelo, who was called divine in yeah, his sure. uh, in his own lifetime. Yeah, the other thing, you can read about those characters and their kind of machinations, actually. They they battled one another. There's stories about Michelangelo arguing and, and taking, you know, doing things. But um, back to this idea of the, and and then over to you, John. I just, I, I really like Valerie as a guest. We haven't had a good, like, I talk like this in a while. The idea that art is is representing or taking science and sharing it with people in a way that um, brings them around. Oh. Uh, how how are, are we? Have we stopped doing that? Is that the problem? Like, have humans <laughs> failed to speak science into life to our to its citizens or something? Yeah. Well, I think these um, 
these older images, the science and the theology weren't separated. They were mm. just trying to explain how things were. Mm. And then when you get to say Copernicus, now in Copernicus's manuscripts, you can see he, he did a very famous diagram with the sun as the center. Mm -hmm. Now that was done as a scientific drawing. We regard it as an artwork. Mm -hmm. Yes. So when are some of these images that they they used either to, you know, the idea of an image is worth several thousand words. Sure. Either they're to explain to scientists in the know or uh, specialists or explaining to the masses that you're using visual images are really important to do this. But when is a, when is such an image a scientific drawing and when is it uh um an artwork now it's still happening nowadays i think after um from the 20th century you do get artworks you know like van gogh in the in the 20th century you get um art uh cosmological and astronomical themes by artists like uh Chagall and Clay and, and Cezanne and so on. A lot of them include astronomy. But um, these are artworks rather than scientific drawings. Now, if you mm. look at science books, um, books say Stephen Hawking's Brief History of Time, um, and Stephen Hawking came from St. Hawkins mm. <laughs> and, and was uh, for a time at the same at, at the school here. Um, but if you look at those, there are no artworks in them. No. So I've been looking at the way that um, artistic images change in relation to the science. It's actually an ugly and, looking book, too. <laughs> yeah. So there, there's sort of no pictures, all these pictures about the beginning and the Big Bang, but there are no pictures in them. But actually, NASA employs artists to create images to explain. And that famous image... Um, of of the nasa you know it's sort of almost a bell shape this is used to um to explain things to everybody specialists mm -hmm. and lay people alike and there is sure. also the um the international association of artists of astronomy is flourishing and mm -hmm. that's there are some presentations by them at this conference the um conference on the inspiration of astronomical phenomena and insap it's called insap.org and there were a lot of artists there as well as scientists um showing these sort of images and showing how it's not just as left to astrophotography nowadays um there are artists at work mm. and trying to use visual images to explain things yeah, I I feel that an, an off, one of the big differences uh, as, as as science has, has crept through. I I will say to, my, to 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 the people that I engage with in a scientific context that I am not a scientist, and because yeah. I am not a scientist, I reserve the right to believe in magic. Yes. And the magic that I believe in <laughs> just is just science well, that you, they though. haven't yeah. found yet. <laughs> and on that basis, oh. when 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 I when when I see the medieval artworks, you go, that's magic. Mm. It's just science it they is... haven't discovered yet. And, and, is, and when Copernicus is... comes along, clearly he had a theory and he mm. proved the theory, but he had to he had to prove it out of the context that people were delivering little slices of magic. Mm. And as but as science has come in and has taken over and has unfortunately has destroyed so many myths. Because we know yeah. what the stars are. You know, we don't have to imagine Orion as being a hunter. We know what Orion is. But in doing that, we lose that. We, we, we lose that ability to go, yeah, but tell me about the magic. Of he's this. still a hunter. Of he's course still he's a, still a hunter. He's still, he's still hunting he is. away up there. Are you he's, still, me? he's still chasing around the sky. Yeah. Yeah. But, and and, and just, that's where, you know, the, the feel, my, my feeling is. It is, is as you, you know, say that, it's as as we it's go quite, you know, as as we move we have to get we have to get science put to one side so that we can we get have, our magic back we have to have a magic we have to have a sense of wonder mm, and a yes. sense of awe and a sense of appreciation you know sparkly things apparently somebody told me recently more women are going into astronomy now mm. than any other any other scientific discipline and and there's one idea that it, women like sparkly things. You know, women like diamonds. Mm. I like diamonds. <laughs> maybe there's a <laughs> maybe there's what? a there's a correlation there. But we need to keep the magic. And I think the magic mm. of the skies 
whatever the science says, I mean, we could talk, I could easily talk for an hour on Copernicus alone, but Copernicus actually presented it as a theory. I, I, I think it, it I, I think most so people improbable. don't understand what Copernicus went through. Like, put yourself in Copernicus's shoes for a second here, okay? He's going to go up to the most powerful man in the world, and he's going to say, sit down for a second, buddy. I got to tell you something here. See this little, this, these circles? These circles? You see them? Right? Sit down. He said, yeah. the, we don't, the, or the sun doesn't go around the earth. We actually go around the sun. Around That's the sun. hard to believe, actually. Even today, 2023, it doesn't look like it, that to me, it, Valerie. <laughs> it's sort of like when you have, you know, when you're on the train leaving a station and the other mm -hmm. train starts to move and you think you're moving, but actually it's the other one. So that's the sort of thing mm. that Copernicus, um, he relied very much on the ancients. He knew that the ancient Greeks had thought of it first, like the ancient Greeks pretty much thought of everything first. Mm -hmm. um, and that the sun was the center of the universe. But the point is the data didn't fit because where you've got, you know, the sun going around the earth, then the planets would have to, you'd have to have epicycles to explain the movement of the planets. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the data didn't fit. And so, Copernicus actually didn't publish it until he was 70 years old, until he was, it was on his deathbed that he got the first copy because he thought he'd be ridiculed. It, not because he feared persecution. The persecution mm. didn't come. He died in 1543. He was born in 1473. Michelangelo was, was two years younger, that's all. And they, they bumped into each other in Rome and, and Bologna, I'm sure of it. And, and the Pope was very interested in those ideas. There is a record that um, the Pope, who, who was a boyhood friend of Michelangelo as well, had actually asked somebody to explain Copernicus's ideas um, because he was interested in it. And of course, because, because Christ is the sun, the analogy between the deity and the sun, and that can be deities from different religious, although with, we're specifically talking about here about the Christian religion. Um, to put to put the de deity at the center of the universe is entirely logical, and all the mm -hmm. data fell into place. And then Galileo mm -hmm. comes along and proves it seventy years later. And then the church starts getting worried. You know, well, you know, the idea of up for heaven, down for hell doesn't work anymore. You've got down for hell and a spherical universe. Then hell becomes a, a spherical earth. If you've got a spherical earth, then down for hell, hell becomes the center of the universe. And that's a bit of a no-no. So Dante has a center of a terrestrial universe and a spherical universe, a, a celestial universe, and and trying to explain these things. And then Copernicus comes in and puts the, the sun in the center and everything falls into place, except as, Cape as Kepler then discovered, they're actually not perfect circles at all. They're ellipses. Mm -hmm. but that's another story yeah yeah I, I and i feel for for me this is all about um it, it, it that there is a there's a, there's an issue here about, about our emotional health our psychological health mm. and the the more mm. that we're abandoned to the mechanics of the universe the less able we are to cope with some of the mysteries um, I, yeah, yes. I love this idea when, you know, when a client says, I, I, I wish I had an emotion meter so that I could measure how people were. <laughs> and you go, well, yeah, I, I, you know, because as, as a lighting designer, I work with emotion. Mm. That's what it's about. Yes, it's not yes, about no, illuminating it's really it so you, so you don't trip over somebody's handbag. Is you create the space so that people feel but... good, bad, however they're meant to be, but they're, they're feeling something which cannot be measured. But... But can I ask you a question here as a lighting person? Um, where you've got lighting, for example, on steps. Yes. Um, can't people just look where they're going? Do you have to have... I want, I want, isn't this a bit I, sort I, of what we call nanny state? That having uh, all this no, lighting? Because, no, I once, lit, I once lit a set of stairs in a hotel so badly that it looked like a slope. Oh, no. <laughs> you mm. couldn't tell the riser from the step. Uh, these things happen, um, yeah. and I, I'm, I was just waiting for somebody, and it would inevitably have, have, have been an, an old person with with brittle bones to trip on the first step <laughs> because they couldn't see it, and mm. so we had to we had to make changes. Um, these, yeah, you know, some of the things that we 
the things that we don't think about tend to be the things that are working. Mm. Yes, yes. And then yes. when something doesn't work, you go, well, that's ridiculous. And you go, you well, only that's notice when something stuff. doesn't work. Yeah, that's very true. Yes, it, 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 exactly. And, and this, this relationship we have with light and dark, light and shade, the, you know, the, the, the reference to the shade and that we, this is something, again, we, we, we spoke around on, on uh, another podcast recently um, about the shadow aspect of, of, of society. Of, of, of how the, yeah. one of the reasons we don't like the dark is because we don't know what's in the what's dark. In there's, there's, a fan, there's a fantastic, it's a, it's a kind of a psycho terror test, Michael. You must go home and try <laughs> yeah. this. I, you, go into a dark, you go into a darkened room, and I mean a darkened room, and you have a mirror in front of you, and you sit down in front of the mirror so that you can see yourself, okay? But then you turn all the lights off until, until your eyes are absolutely dark adapted, and you can just about make out the image in the mirror and then you stay there yeah and you stay there and you stay there until what you see <laughs> that's really intense, is not man. you okay oh, woo. because bloody that's mary. the power bloody you know, the mary pa that's the, power the bloody of the, mary the power of darkness the, yeah. the power of the darkness is is there and, and it, because it's what's mm. going on in here i'm doing it yeah. tonight. it's all the but night it, it's all the nightmares and everything everything associated with the dark yeah that's it's interesting it's interesting that you raise the issue about shadows because i've done some work on shadows in paintings and they're pretty mm. unusual mm. Be before about the 15th century you do get some in ancient art but then if you come up to shadows where shadows might even be the subject of the painting or if mm. you think of a, a hitchcock thriller where the, sure. the shadow cast on the wall leaves you into no doubt as to who the villain is sort of mm -hmm. thing so shadows and shadows in art they're pretty much left out because it would you know, they're everywhere, but it would even sort of clutter up the painting even more if you put all the shadows in. So shadows yeah. and what they contain as a, a shadow is, um, Leonardo da Vinci wrote a lot about shadows in in real life and, you know, from a scientific point of view and also shadows in painting and that shadow, the way that shadows lie, lie between light and dark and how they mm, can be that, used that, for, that for different reasons. That liminal place yeah. between yeah. what yeah. is and what might be. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Sorry, Michael. <laughs> Nothing, sorry. No, I, I'm, I'm listening here. Um, you know, it, I can't help but think of The Midsummer Night's Dream, another Shakespeare reference, where I, I think we are wondrous creatures that want to jump around in the sublime a little bit. Like, I, I don't think that yeah. this representation of science man as coolly rational all the time fits humans. I think we're, I think we need the moon and the sun. And you were talking about more women are entering astronomy. I, you know, I think of it, you know, maybe there needs to be a more of a feminine force in that realm, you know, something that's, you know, that brings a different way of looking at things. I think that's what you're saying, right? Is that if more women enter astronomy, it will change the way we look at it. I'm, I'm not saying that. It's just, it's just a fact that there are more women graduates, more postdocs oh. in astronomy in England at the moment. Um, I don't know if women, you know, you women of my age, of course, um, had, had a tough time when we were younger. Um, and I think, you know, women can have a different perspective on things, but you should have the best people and whether they, mm. should, you know, we were in the sixties, we were trying to be treated the same, not, not to be given any special preferences, but to have the same opportunities. And I think that's important. And there are certain professions that appeal more to women for some reason or other and more to men. Um, I know female astro um, astronomers, female engineers. Um, Do you know any female electricians? I don't think I've ever met yep. a female electrician. My, and I own, oh, electrical, yeah. I own an electrical contracting a female company. Female electrician. <laughs> I never I, met one. Yeah, I, I've only yeah, had I I've had one person interview for the job ever. But anyway, I wanted to say that you know, <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you this: you actually proved to me why the Earth is round. Um, and I've never had anyone give me any proof of that in my life. I was told always to believe it. Like, how do we come about to get, get that theory? And you said that the because the math works better like this. Actually, if you think yes. about how it works, well, I think that's fascinating. But the, the other reason, you know, thinking the Earth was round was the way that the mast of a ship disappears before its mast mm -hmm. yeah. and the shadow cast by the Earth on the on the sun, um, the shadow, 
Cast but the Earth the revolving sun. around the sun on, is not on, as obvious. On the, moon. the Earth yes, revolving that, around the, the sun the is not as obvious. Yeah, is that? Yeah, that the math of uh, not needing epicycles um, really explains the movement. But things like mm. the shadow cut of the Earth cast on the Moon during an eclipse, mm -hmm. um, and there being, you know, uh, there are some quite humorous images of that, which I've used in some of the talks I've given, which are referenced on my website. But the thing is that it, it's it's more logical. Um, and then, of course, there's this whole idea about, um, you know, whether the moon landings were, were fabricated, which clearly not. But the point is, if you look at things like the photograph, the famous photograph, I think it was from one of the Apollo missions of Earthrise, mm -hmm. and you can see the whole the whole Earth, or from the Voyager mission, what's called the pale blue dot. Mm -hmm. And you see this little yeah. tiny dot, which is us. And, mm. you know, we're all in this together. Um, this is mm. all we've got. We've got sure. to save this. I think light pollution is part of, you know, climate control and pollution in general. And mm. I think the pale blue dot, you know, there will come a time when none of this is remembered. In millions mm. of years' time, no one will remember that, that um, you know, there was a, a one tiny planet that that had all these civilizations on it, but that hopefully will be not for millions and millions of years. Wow! Right. Hey, <laughs> uh, Michael, I'm I'm, I'm going to point something out here. Um, sure. We've been watching the light fade on Valerie. Yes, a, yeah. it, and it, and it's, oh, and yes, it's, yes, it's, yes. It's, 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 it's been a gorgeous thing to watch. Yes, actually, it has been. you're right. You're right. <laughs> actually, I've trying to see the, the, the dynamics times. of all of that working. While, yeah, I could put a light on. Yes, I can just see some we pink have, clouds over here. Yeah. yeah, we have no natural light where we are at all. You know, I'm in mm. I'm in my little room, and Michael's in his little studio. Mm. And yeah, I'm in my changed. house in my study. Yeah. Mm. And it looks fant it looks fantastic. It's just been yeah. what it's just been lovely to watch the light fade. But the point is, the light is fading. The light and is the moon is a so, harsh mistress, as we know. Yeah, anybody noticing that would would want would want it explained. Like small children want it explained why. And the yeah. idea of where a child, a small child, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about my grandchildren here, mm. know that they came from you know their mother's stomach or whatever. Mm. When they see the mother pregnant with another baby, and then the other baby arrives somehow. You know, they don't know all the details, but they want to know where they came from. And for example, they want to know that I'm I'm their mummy's mummy sort mm -hmm. of thing. You know, there's a there's a, even in a in a two three year old, mm -hmm. there's a wish, an innate wish to want to know where you come from. And I think mm -hmm. when you're talking about individuals, that's one thing. But when you're talking about civilizations and planets and galaxies and solar systems and the universe. That it, it's the heavens that inspires us. It's the heavens that mm. that make us think about these things, and the wonder and amazement. And and that's why you know for the dark skies to be obliterated, apart from the effect on ecosystems and everything else, it is just so important. You know, if if, if the insects go to the lights and get eaten, no insects, mm. no no animals, no no birds, no humans, no anything. You know, it's it's yes. all these. The great chain of being is so important. Mm -hmm. And also, but the 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 uh, artistic and the spiritual reasons for us to cherish our night skies are endless, as as you Absolutely. can see from your yes. your work and 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 that. Um, John, do you have any um, final thoughts for Valerie and the, what a wonderful time we've spent with her? Any any final questions, John? Well, not. <clears throat> I think what what Valerie, what you've what you've done for us is is that you've you've just um, you've just reminded us that everything that we're talking about has been there for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. That the human race has grown up with that. That it's only within the, it's only in the last five minutes yeah. that we've forgotten about that. That we've created a world where we can ignore it. Mm. And yeah. it's it's a it, it what all, what we you know, we must not do light festivals anymore, Michael. We must do dark festivals. Sure, yeah. I'm with That's you. That's what we have I'm to there. do. We have to bring the magic yeah, back. I agree. It's as simple and as complicated yeah. as that. Yeah. That's me. No, that's Valerie, good, I think that's a really good way of putting it. Thank so, you. Do you have any um, final thoughts? Um, 
Dr. Um, Valerie Shrimplin for the for the Restoring Darkness listeners and fans out there across the world, actually. Yeah, I, ju- I just one thing I haven't mentioned, which I mentioned in talks that you can reference is the way that if you look at, at maps of population increase on 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 our planet. Um, and you can see you can take a rough correlation between co- population increase and light pollution increase. Sure. Perhaps not so much where there are hugely populated, very poor areas nowadays. Mm-hmm. But if you look at the correlation between the increase in population and the increase in light pollution and the way that people are sort of losing this magic, if you like, mm-hmm. um, and not looking upwards and not seeing the Milky Way, which so few people have seen, um, that it, it shows how important it is to try and preserve this and and not waste resources that are becoming more and more limited Mm. on things that we don't really need all Mm -hmm. this all this light Mm -hmm. folks if you made it to the end with um john bullock dr valerie trimplin and myself we thank you what a wonderful pleasure it was to have her on the show and um i'd like you to think about something for a second Restoring Darkness listeners, and I've been advocating this on a couple different shows, is that um, darkness restoration, night preservation, dark skies, whatever you want to call it, is the most solvable environmental problem we have. We have all the technology we need to do it, and we have the control systems. We know what to do. The industry will make a million, well, everybody's going to get rich. That's right. If you're in the lighting industry, there's tons of light fixtures to change and all that sort of stuff. So as an industry, as a community, we need to get on board with darkness restoration, night preservation, dark skies, whatever the heck you want to call it. Everybody needs to get on board and we need to start telling the climate change folks, hey, give us some of that money because we know what to do right now and it's going to save tons of energy. And it's going to reduce, it's going to help with biology and all that sort of stuff. So think about elevating the restoring darkness issue to the top of the list, folks. And thank you for listening. Bye for now. Look no further for dark sky friendly products than Evluma. Since its first product launch, Evluma has carried one or more International Dark Sky Association certified models. If your customer cares about light pollution, Suggest the Omnimax with shielding or the Ariamax with full cutoff to reduce uplight and glare. Evluma, illuminating the pursuit of darkness.